chapter 17. We're looking today at Mystery Babylon. I, I mentioned to the first service that uh, when, I, when I put together my notes, I usually have seven pages. Today we have nine that tells you something. So we'll be here for a while. Just get ready. I hope you brought your pillows. And you with your bunny slippers and blanket, uh, you're going to enjoy this. you get a good nap. But I'll be looking at a lot of, I'll actually read more of my notes to you because I want to stay on track because there's so many uh, things that you see here, uh, and I don't want to start uh, traveling on down uh, a trail I ought not to go. So you'll notice that a little more than usual, I will be looking at my notes just to make sure I keep myself on track. We're looking at Mystery Babylon, beginning at verse 1, Revelation chapter 17, reading to verse 6. John writes, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads, and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. So as we've already seen, not all the events, for those of you who have been with us in this study, not all the events of Revelation are recorded in chronological order. We have been looking at judgments, and we saw that, that there are going to be a series of three judgments that will take place on the earth. We saw how there was the seal judgment, which led itself to the trumpet judgment. And then you have the conclusion of God's wrath being poured out on the earth in what are called the final judgments or the bowl judgments. So you have the seal, the trumpet, and the bowl judgments. In chapter 16, uh, that chapter gave us events that immediately precede the second coming of Jesus Christ. We'll be looking at the second coming in chapter 19. So the events that are found in chapter 17 occur chronologically prior to the bold judgments that we looked at in chapter 16. They're giving us more insight into what's taking place that was leading up, in other words, to what are called the bold judgments. Now, when we look at this, I've been mentioning this, and, and, and I have to be quick to say that uh, a lot of times when I'm speaking to my fellowship, I make assumptions that are probably not correct. I forget that there are people that are watching right now online in, in a lot of countries who perhaps have never been with us in even a single study. And then I forget that there are people perhaps who are visiting today for the first time who may not have ever read in the book of Revelation. And I'm assuming to, that you all know the things I'm speaking in. And we used to call that language Christianese, but what happens is we're speaking amongst ourselves and, and not being polite or aware that some may be confused. And that's why I want to take my time a little bit more today to make sure that the things that I'm speaking are clear and all of that. And so when I speak of tribulation, we're speaking really of the seven-year period of God pouring out his wrath on a Christ-rejecting world. This tribulation period is called tribulation, the first three and a half years. The second three and a half years are called great tribulation. So it's actually divided into uh, two segments of three and a half years or so uh, each. And so we've been looking at this period called the tribulation. People's rejection of grace, their unwillingness to repent, will be harshly dealt with. You see, it's a time when God pours out his wrath on a world that has rejected Jesus Christ. When we read the Bible just this last week when we celebrated uh, Easter together, I, I, I made a point of pointing out that, that Jesus Christ is accessible, that Jesus Christ is loving and caring and he forgives and all of that because that's the core of our beliefs, that Christ took upon himself 
Our sin died on the cross, was buried, but the third day arose for our justification. That's called the Christian, that's the gospel. But we forget that there's an other portion that we don't really touch on concerning God, which is his wrath. Because not only is God gracious in that he sent his son, but he also has wrath or an anger that he pours out on those who rejected Jesus Christ. And so in his righteous anger, he's pouring out his wrath on those who rejected Jesus. And through unbelief and hardness of heart, these are those who prefer their sin over salvation. Well, in preferring their sin over salvation, they leave themselves open to judgment for their sin. And God will bring judgment on the world for this. And this judgment is spoken of both in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. For example, in the Old Testament, Isaiah 26, 21 says, Behold, the Lord is coming out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. And the earth will disclose the uh, blood shed on it and will no more cover its slain. So God is bringing uh, his wrath to punish the inhabitants for their wickedness, for their iniquity. Psalm 75, 8 says, In the hand of the Lord there's a cup with foaming wine, well mixed, and he pours out from it. And all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. So God's wrath in many places is, is shown in Scripture in the Old Testament as well as the New. In the New Testament, God's wrath is spoken of in Romans 1.18, for example, where it says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So the time of God unleashing his wrath on earth is clearly seen in what is called the tribulation. The outpouring of wrath is referred to in, in chapter 6 as the wrath of the Lamb. Now, Christians will not taste of God's wrath because we have trusted in Christ, because Jesus delivers us. He delivers us from the tribulation. We are present right now, and he will also be with those who convert to him during that tribulation. But we ourselves, present believers, will be delivered from the tribulation. We will not go through it. We will not go through the wrath of God in his judgment. Romans 5, 8, and 9 says, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God? In 1 Thessalonians 1, 10, it says that believers wait for God's Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So in this passage, we're introduced to Mystery Babylon. Mystery Babylon is the tool of Antichrist. In chapters 17 and 18, Babylon is used as a picture of man's kingdoms on earth. Babylon is intended to be more than a city in Iraq, though there obviously is a literal Babylon in Iraq, but Babylon is intended to be more than that. Babylon speaks of something beyond the name. It represents something else. We speak of Hollywood, and when you speak of Hollywood, you don't speak of it as just the city. When they say it's, it's Hollywood, we're talking about the movie industry. Wall Street speaks of commerce or the stock market. Madison Avenue speaks of advertising. Detroit, we speak of the automobile Beale industry and in Chino, we speak of flies. I mean, it all represents <laughs> something different. Mystery Babylon. Mystery Babylon speaks of a system that dominates the world during this period called the tribulation. It is economic, it is political, and it's religious. And it's established by the Antichrist. Chapter 17 refers to Mystery Babylon the religious Babylon, if you will. Chapter 18 speaks of commercial Bab Babylon. And so we're going to be looking in chapter 17 today, God's judgment on the Antichrist's false religious system. Uh, by this point, Antichrist has allowed religion to continue as long as religion has suited his purpose. But God is now judging his false religious system. You see, Satan has taken advantage of man's innate urge to worship something. Man has something within himself and herself, mankind, that desires to worship something. The 18th century French philosopher, a man by the name of Voltaire, once said, if God did not exist, it would be necessary to invent him. 
You see, Satan is aware that humans desire to worship something great. Somebody said every human has an innate desire to admire, praise, and to be part of something greater than himself or herself, and that's true. And so Satan has set up, the seeds have already been planted, but he has set up a kingdom that is modeled after God's because the intent is for him to be worshipped. In Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, it's made very clear. He was the worship leader of heaven, but because he desired to be like the Most High, he has what are called the five I wills in Isaiah 14. I will be like the Most High. I will set up my throne. His desire is to be worshipped. And so as we read the New Testament, we discover that he has demon hosts that are disguised as angels of light, that he has ministers who present themselves as true ministers. He has a counterfeit gospel that's called the doctrines of demons. He has a false Messiah, Antichrist, and a false spirit. You can see this in Galatians chapter 1 as well as 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and 1 Timothy chapter 4. And so these are all outlined for us. So he has a counterfeit kingdom that he's already been moving into place. And he has a promise that he gives in his false message. And his promise is freedom. But the promise that he gives to us is always a lie. And it's intended to bring people into bondage. And it says that very clearly in 2 Peter 2.19. Speaking of false teachers, where the apostle Peter said, they promised them freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity, he said, for people are slaves to whatever mastered them. And so Satan has uh, uh, given power to the beast who has a false prophet. We've been seeing this as we've gone through Revelation, and he has a false religious system. Now, we know that there are religious systems found throughout the world, and it is this that the Antichrist will take advantage of. You see, during his reign, the diverse religions will combine into one great world religion. And there are so many differences that we have, you would begin to wonder, is that even possible? Well, it is possible. All you need to do is drive, and after a while, you will see a bumper sticker that says coexist with all of these different emblems of religion used to spell the word coexist. Yeah, it's already possible. It's already here. The seeds have been planted. Now, there are those who think that religion is repugnant. It's a, an idea that they really don't like at all. They think that uh, it's not worth anything, but, but we know that religious faith is what keeps societies like our own alive. It is shared beliefs that develop social, what are called social mores, the customs of our society, the customs of our community. They're called social mores, customs. Um, it is shared religious traditions that keep societies stable and actually bring unity to people. It provides a faith fabric that establishes social contracts. It, it, it is religion and the belief in the supernatural that transcends the barriers in society. It unites people around a common core of essential beliefs, and, and that's what makes some things acceptable and other things not acceptable. And there may be some watching right now, perhaps even here, who are saying, I don't believe that at all. Yes, you do. You just don't realize it. Well, I don't believe in a faith. I don't have a faith. I don't have a religion. I don't, I, I don't think that's true at all. Oh, really? Okay, you're, at, you're, uh, you're standing in line, and as you're standing in line, you've been there for a good 20, 30 minutes, and it's not moving too much, and you're starting to get irritated. You have other things to do. And as you're standing in line, somebody decides to walk and cut in line a few people in front of you. Do you say, oh, please do? Or do you have something inside of you that says, that's not right? Well, the question has to be asked, why isn't it right? Why isn't that right? Because you have a social moray. You have, a, you have a, 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 a cultural contract, a social contract, because it's not right for you to sit in front of somebody who's been waiting patiently. That's why. Where'd you get that from? You got that from Jesus Christ. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you is so much a part of our fabric, we don't even realize it. So yes, religion has unified us. Every law that you have in the United States, every law that we have is really just a... a uh, a, an extension of the Ten Commandments. Is it right to kill people? No. Is it right to steal? No. Why not? Well, that's what created our culture. And there are certain things or certain elements that are within cultures, all cultures, that are pretty much the same or very similar. And so what Antichrist will do is he's going to have a religious system that taps into the core desires of human beings. His system's going to have an appeal to all religious faiths. He'll unite the essential elements. 
He'll have a religious system that rejects the true God and worships him instead, but he's going to unite the essentials. He's going to concentrate on, accentuate the things that bring people together. He'll lead people to put into practice common precepts for goodness embraced by all major religions. Those things include the desire for love or the desire to benefit others, the process of making people better human beings by living a truly moral life. He'll unite prayer, spiritual discipline. All of those things would be part of his religious system. And since human beings have the desire to worship something greater than themselves, he's going to be the center. I mentioned a moment ago, as we've already seen, he has a false prophet. He makes sure that people follow and worship him. Revelation 13, 12 says that the false prophet exercises all the authority of the first beast, Antichrist, in his presence. He causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. When Paul was writing in 2 Thess- Thessalonians 2, verse 4, he said that Antichrist opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So John gave us chapter 17 and chapter 18 to clarify for us what is being judged. These chapters show us that the world system under Antichrist is being judged. And they give us insight into why judgment has fallen and its destruction. We're looking at Mystery Babylon, the mother of all false religions and her judgment. So in verses 1 and 2, that was your intro. Let's get into our study. One of the seven angels from chapter 16 who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So we were introduced to seven angels in chapter 16 who uh, pour out the bowl judgments. So this would mean that John ties in the judgment with the seven last plagues. And John is invited to see the judgment that God brings on false religion. Notice it's referred to as the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. And you'll see in verse 15 uh, how he says that. But what does he speak of when he speaks of sitting on many waters. I'll just give you a a real brief uh, touch on that. We know that in ancient times, cities would be built next to oceans, rivers, or streams. You can see in Rome that it's built on the Tiber or England's on the Thames. You have Paris on the Seine. Uh, Munich has the Isar. Moscow has the Moskva. And Egypt has the Nile and Babylon, the Euphrates. And so ancient civilizations, even even fairly recent modern civilizations would build on water sources. So it speaks of a a city that you could immediately think of Babylon on the Euphrates, but in this case, many waters doesn't only speak of a geographic location because, again, in verse 15, we'll see that in about two hours. In in verse 15, uh, this, this phrase speaks of peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So what this is referring to is the incredible influence that Mystery Babylon has on the world, not in a geographic location. Notice how in verse 2, he says, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. And so Mystery Babylon is not only an influence. Mystery Babylon dominates. Mystery Babylon dominates the unsaved world. It's not bound to a single location, in other words. It's worldwide because the world wonders after the beast, as it says in Revelation 13, 3, all the world marveled and followed the beast. So this is a worldwide influence. And these are the highest levels of government that's being spoken of, of power and influence. And he says those of that high level will fornicate with her. When he says they're going to fornicate, the word fornicate speaks of them being spiritually involved. They're going to be what are called true believers. They're obsessed with the system. They're fully committed to false religion. And not only are the inhabitants influenced, but the rest of the unbelieving world will be too. All the inhabitants of the earth are taken by this system. So verse 2 says, the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. 
It reminds us of something in the Old Testament the prophet Jeremiah said in chapter 51, verse 7, where he said, Babylon has been a golden cup in the hand of the Lord, intoxicating all the earth. The nations have drunk of her wine, therefore the nations are going mad. So her influence does not begin during the tribulation. Her influence has actually existed throughout history. You see, the, mystery of Ma uh, uh, the influence of mystery Babylon has already invaded all nations of the world, even as I'm speaking. It's, the seeds are already there. It, it is a worldwide deception. It's the rejection of the truth in the Bible and the substitution of Satan's lies. It's like all the way back in the book of Genesis in chapter 3 with, where, where the, the question is asked, the first question mark uh, is, is placed in Scripture. The first question is asked, and it comes out of the mouth of Satan himself, the serpent, and he says, has God said? So all the way in the very beginning, when the serpent went into the garden and began to, to uh, uh, tempt Eve and all of that, the first thing he did is he called into question God's word. And Satan has done that from the very beginning. And this deceptive religious influence has existed since ancient time. Babylon has been used as a symbol in Scripture. It's mentioned in Genesis chapter 11 and is associated with rebellion and confusion. Babylonian worship has long permeated the world's religious system. It's an ancient false system of worship influencing religion throughout the ages. The Babylonian worship system will be the accepted system under the tribulation. So, the atmosphere needed for the acceptance of a mystery religion, mystery Babylon, is already here. In our day, Christianity is losing its influence in the world. I was looking at this just this week, and uh, I went to uh, look at some research by an organization called Pew Research, and Pew Research estimates that today there are 1.1 million Hindus, 1.8 billion Muslims, but they estimate there are 2.3 billion professing Christians in the world. So with that said, Christianity, though it is numerically large, is actually losing its impact, and it's losing its impact here in the United States. A, a recent Gallup poll found that 66% of American adults born before 1946 go to church. 50% of baby boomers go to church. 58, rather. 50% 50 of Generation X go to church. 36% of Generation Y, millennials, go to church, and it gets less as you continue on. According to researcher Ryan Burge, an assistant professor of political science at Eastern Illinois University, pastor of the American Baptist Church, said in the next 30 years, the United States will not have one dominant religion. Christianity is rapidly losing its impact on the West. Great Britain's a great example. Great Britain once sent out missionaries throughout the world. Today, it has a population estimated at 66 million. And in Great Britain, the place that used to send all through the world missionaries, 66 million population, 2 million what are called evangelical Christians. Out of 66, 2 million evangelical. I am an evangelical Christian. What is an evangelical Christian? Well, we, we, our faith is centered in Jesus Christ. We witness our faith. We're committed to the truth of Scripture. We live daily for Jesus Christ. We're waiting for his return. Those are five of the earmarks of an evangelical. There's only 2 million of them in Great Britain today. I was recently listening to somebody speak, and he said that around one out of four churches have closed their door during this COVID, COVID time permanently. One church out of four closed their doors permanently. Their people no longer come to church. And there's a growing spiritual vacuum that will be filled by this religious system. The New Testament contains many warnings concerning that time. In 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, Paul said the Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. In the book of Jude, verse 4, Jude said, I say this because some godless people have wormed their way in among you, saying that God's forgiveness allows us to live immoral lives, 
The fate of such people was determined long ago. They have turned against our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, the apostle said, There were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their shameful ways and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with stories they've made up. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. So Mystery Babylon is waiting in the wings even as I'm speaking. In many American churches, feel-good theology prevails. Verse-by-verse -verse studies are not the norm. The Bible is disrespected. Rebellion exists concerning biblical authorities. Signs and wonders are exalted. False love with no discernment is confused with the fruit of the Spirit, and grace has been twisted into permission to continue to sin. There are many pastors who are aware of the fact that people get upset and will cancel them in their church, so they try to walk a very, very tight rope to make sure they don't offend people. And yet, I think that what has happened is people just don't read their Bible because if they did, they'd have to read what Jesus said in Matthew 23 when he was speaking to the religious leaders and he said, you're whitewashed tombs. He spoke in a way that you wouldn't, you wouldn't think. How is, I thought God was love. You know what? He's also just and righteous. I mean, he took a whip and, he, and do you think he was smiling when he cast people out of the temple? Hi there. <laughs> Happy birthday. No. God has that side that we, we ignore, that we ignore, and we have to give the whole counsel of God, the grace as well as the judgment. You see, so the seeds are already planted, and during the tribulation, they will fully blossom. And so he speaks of this great harlot in verse 3, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. I, I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So notice he says, I was carried away in the spirit into the wilderness. The wilderness speaks of a dry waste land. You go to Israel, as I was mentioning earlier before I began to teach, and you will go through these areas and you'll say, oh, so that's what the wilderness is. And you'll see many places like that in Israel because Israel is many areas is very dry, and you'll see that. So this is a picture of lifeless religion. It is dry, and there is no living water. That's why Jesus would say, if you drink from him, you'll have living water, water that you can drink and survive. Well, as he's in this wilderness, he sees a woman uh, sitting on a scarlet beast, notice which, has, which was full of names of blasphemy. So she's on the scarlet beast, that reveals that the beast is supporting her. And it's really speaking here of Antichrist. You've already seen that in chapter 13 and chapter 14 as well as chapter 16. So this reveals that Antichrist religion is the unifying force. And there's going to be a temporary alliance that at first unites. We'll see in verse 16 at, at the end it, that, that uh, uh, religious system is going to uh, be dissolved. But notice again in verse 3, the beast is full of names of blasphemy, having seven horns. So Antichrist takes for himself names and titles that only belong to God. And he's going to not only uh, be called by those, but he will also speak blasphemies against God. When you look into the Old Testament, speaking of the same thing, you see in Daniel 11.36, something about what has been referred to as another title of Antichrist, and he's called the king or the willful king. And in Daniel 11.36, it says, The king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will say unheard of things against the god of gods, blasphemies. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed, for what has been determined must take place. And so verse 3, the scarlet beast has seven heads, ten horns. That speaks of his alliances. We'll see that in a moment in verses 9 and 10. But the seven heads are seven mountains. Seven mountains are kings, five fallen, one existing, one future. The ten horns are ten kings who will rule as subordinate to the willful king. 
Now notice how she's dressed. The woman was arrayed in purple, verse 4, and scarlet, adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And so as you look at her, she is, she's called a harlot, which is another word for a prostitute. And uh, prostitutes could and often did and still do address, uh, dress in such a way as to draw attention. And Mystery Babylon is no different. When it speaks concerning her, the color, she's arrayed in purple. Purple is the color in Scripture of royalty. Scarlet, scarlet is red. It, it's a picture of, of, uh, of prosperity, but it is also a picture of redemption. Gold and precious stones would just give to us the insight. She's very successful in her work. She has a golden cup filled with an intoxicating drink. And that, again, was common in ancient mystery religions. A cup of drugged wine would be given to the person who was, was worshiping. And uh, that would be a picture of a false spirit. So she gives her followers wine because it dulls their senses, it excites their passions, and it renders an them unable to discern truth from error. And that's what happens. Uh, I have a few people, if I look out, I, I can tell you which ones, who used to drink. I'm not looking at you, John. And all I would need is a mirror, really, to be honest with you. Um, and anybody who used to drink to excess knows this, that at a certain point, you're not able to think clearly. You just can't. You may think you are. You may think you're the sharpest knife in, 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 the, in the box, but you're not. You're just you're being dulled. Your senses are being dulled because that's what alcohol does. And so that's a picture of this, that, that, that they, she has deceived them and put them into what would be called a spiritual stupor. They're, they're dulled. They don't understand what's taking place. And early mystery religions, that's what they would do with their pr practitioners. If you wanted to be initiated into a particular uh, Greek we'll say religion, they would also drug you because what it does is it makes you incapable of thinking and making good decisions. And that's the picture here. She's a seductress. There's a false spirit that is stupefying the people and they're being deceived. Verse 5 tells us on her forehead, a name was written. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the and of the abominations of the earth. And so that's what she's known as. And so she's a picture of the world's resistance to God himself. Her influence, great. But she is the source of all false worship in the last days. And as John is looking, verse 6, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of saints, with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. She is a savage beast. She has a lust for violence. She destroys believers. Sometimes people uh, in our day, and it's not just our day, I'll be honest with you, it's been for as long as I've been a believer, and I'm certain it's been for years long, long before that. that I, but I have had as a pastor many experiences with people who, who get offended and angry because you present what the Bible says. We try to do a verse by verse and contextualize it, present it properly. That's what we do. And then you have people, some, who get upset and angry. Uh, uh, it wasn't that long ago that uh, a friend of mine was telling me that uh, he was, uh, uh, works as a police officer and was being briefed by the, uh, uh, who, whatever they call that guy, before they go out on patrol, and uh, he said that the guy said, uh, he used my name. And this guy who told me goes to our church. And he told me, he said, your name was mentioned in a briefing. I said, really? He said, yeah. That, that, that the guy who was doing the briefing said, you're a, um, you're a teacher of hate. And that you, 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 you have hate speech. And I said, really? Is that right? Well, boy, I've graduated, really. Um, <laughs> but see, that's what happens, though. See? If you tell what is true, if you try to be, and I'm not, I'm not asking you to admire me. Forgive me if it even sounds that way. But I'm saying is when you teach the truth, there are people who don't know how to respond to it. And sometimes they do get angry, and sometimes they will call you names and all of that, and that happens. And, and, and the reason that people like me will tell you what the truth is is because we want you, we want you free. 
We don't want you to be in bondage. And the truth sets you free, so we'll tell you the truth. See, and, and that's what we do. But not everybody appreciates that. And so the real picture of this woman is that she's savage. She has a lust for violence. She destroys believers. But John, John is dazzled. He's, he's shocked. He's astonished. He's even a bit confused at what he sees. You see, on, on the one hand, she's a picture of beauty, but on the other, she's filled with murder. And so as he's looking in, it, and marveling, in, in verse 7, it says, the angel said to me, why did you marvel? I'll tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and ten horns. Why are you confused? What is this that is puzzling you? Uh, what is it that you're seeing that you have, have trouble with? You see, John knew that the woman was false religion. He knew that the beast was antichrist. But what he seems to be puzzled at is the connection between the false religion and the antichrist. And so in verse 8, it says, The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. And so she began, he begins to speak to him. And so when it says the beast that you saw was, is not, and will ascend, that would speak of his supposed death and resurrection. The faked resurrection will be used to deceive the world. And it's at that point, in chapter 11 we saw this, that Antichrist will be possessed by a powerful demon from the abyss. The beast is of satanic origin. Chapter 13 of Revelation, as you may remember, reveals that Satan gives him his throne and power. The result was that the earth would marvel after and follow him. It says in verse 8, those who dwell on earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life. The ungodly are the ones whose names are not written in the book of life. Those whose names are written in the book of life are believers. And so, the unbelieving world will follow after the beast. The religious system will be their belief system. People who have been converted through the witnesses, so many witnesses that are taking place during the time of the tribulation, because there will be, there will be 144,000 uh, evangelists, there'll be two angels, uh, there'll be an angel, there'll be two witnesses, there'll be a continuation of, of witnessing to bring people to faith, they're going to come to faith in Christ. They will not be deceived because they know the truth and it set them free. But the rest of the world marvels and follows after the Antichrist and are devoted to his religious system. And so he says in verse 9, here's the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is and the other has not yet come. When he comes, he must continue a short time. The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition. And so he begins to outline, the angel begins to outline and explain to him. And that's why in verse 9, here is a mind which has wisdom. And the mountains... The mountains represent seven successive kings and their kingdoms. Mountains in Scripture are used often to represent a kingdom, authority, or an empire. Uh, Psalm 30, verse 7 is an example. O Lord, when you favored me, you made my mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. In verse 10, he speaks of seven kings, five fallen, the other has not yet come, etc. One is and the other has not yet come. That reveals successive kingdoms throughout history. Five great empires already existed and had ceased. Egypt and Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. One is, would speak of the world government existing in John's day, which was Rome. One empire is yet to come. That's Antichrist, what would be called his initial coalition. Now, in verse 10, notice the seventh empire, which is Antichrist's, will not last long. It's short duration. It, it, it will develop from the ten-nation confederacy. And so I'll say this briefly. Out of the seventh empire, that's the ten-nation confederacy, 
will come the Antichrist. This will exist. Antichrist will receive his apparent mortal wound. He's going to fake his own resurrection. He'll become the leader of what is called the Eighth Empire. In verse 11, he will in himself be the Eighth Empire. Now, verse 12, the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. These will make war with the lamb, and the lamb will overcome them. He is Lord of lords and king of kings, and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. Isn't that refreshing after all we've been reading to see that? Praise the Lord for that. And so we'll look at that. In uh, verses 12 and 13, these are 10 nations that are not in existence during the time of John. They're not in existence. These are what would be called end time empires under Antichrist. These are empires that will be a coalition that take orders from Antichrist. It's interesting how it says here he's going to have some effect on three of the kings, and that's up for supposition. Not everybody knows exactly. Very few people would be able to speak with any authority on what exactly that means. But in Daniel chapter 7, verse 8, it says, While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one. That's another name for Antichrist. He's also referred to as the little horn, which came up among them. And three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth that spoke boastfully. So something's going to take place in the ten-nation confederacy where three of those nations are going to be dealt with in a different way. But what happens is, verse 14, 14 they will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. He's Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. This is the war that we'll be looking at in a couple of weeks in chapter 19. We're going to be looking at Armageddon. It's when Jesus returns. And when Jesus returns, these evil forces will be arrayed against him, but they will be destroyed. We'll look at that in some detail, obviously, when we get to chapter uh, 19. But i now close by reading and kind of sharing a little bit. Then he said to me in verse 15, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. The ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire. In other words, a religious system is going to go until Antichrist doesn't need it any longer and will turn against the religious system. For God, verse 17, has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind, to give the kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Are we ready for this? I believe that in the United States, and I'll kind of share a little bit with you as I'm about to conclude. Are we ready for this? We're living in a time when the seeds of this kind of religious system have already been planted and, and, and people like myself and others who attempt to, to faithfully uh, give the word of God uh, are often not listened to because we're looked at as being kind of weird and, and, and you know, uh, just odd. You know, you believe that nonsense and all of that. But all you have to do is look at the, at the nation that we live in right now and ask yourself, how did we get here? How, how did we get here? And, and it's not as if you hate your, your nation. I love our nation. I love the people of our nation. I want to see God move in our nation. I want to see the churches come alive, and I want to see people saved. I, 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 I served in the military of this nation. I was willing to, if I had been put in the position, I would have died for this nation. It's not that I don't love my nation. I love my nation. But I also see what's taking place in this nation. Listen, when I grew up, and now, yeah, okay, that's ancient history. I might as well give you a little. But I grew up in a time when, listen, it, it, we, we grew up in a different way. We grew up, uh, my, my generation grew up in a different way. We grew up in a time like, I'll, get, I'll give you an example. My dad, I, I could not speak with disrespect to my father. 
My, my dad got angry at me on one occasion, and I still remember, because he had called me. I was maybe nine years old or so, and my, my dad called me and said, David, and I said, yeah, and my dad said, what did you say? Yeah, to my father was almost swearing at him. Now, does that make sense to any here? The older, yes. The younger, are you kidding me? You know, but the older, we understand that. You do not disrespect your father. I was taught that. When you're in a bus and an older woman or an older man gets on the bus, what's old? Anything older than you, pretty much. If you see gray hair in their face or they don't have any hair, that's an old person. You stand up and you give them your seat. Anybody get raised that way? I was raised that way. If an older person walked into the room, if an older person walked into the room as a young boy, I was told to stand up in respect because you rise in the presence of the aged. That's what you do. My parents taught me to do that. Did I call my neighbors by their first name? No, it was Mrs. Jones, Mr. Jones. Why? You show them respect. Even to this day, I call my mother-in-law Mrs. Lopez because that's respect for her. That's how I was raised. No, I wasn't a perfect kid. Many of you know my testimony. I did a lot of bad things. But my dad and mom taught me certain things that I held fast to because they were right. Grew up in a time when it's, uh, it's Easter or it's Christmas. And during Christmas, you had Jewish comedians like a guy named Jack Benny. Look him up. He's, you can Google him. He, he was a Jewish comedian who had Christmas specials. And he didn't run off the stage holding his heart saying, you said Jesus he welcomed them to sing Christmas songs. Why? Because America at that time actually believed that religion mattered. You didn't steal from your neighbor. You didn't swear in front of ladies. You didn't act the way that people act today and have no concern over it. If you were on a bus and an older person came, I was taught to stand up and offer him my seat. But you can see pictures today where this old woman's holding on to the, the rail trying to stay up while these kids are in their iPhone. Do I hate kids? Yeah. No, do I hate, do I hate young people? No, of course, it's a different world. A different world. Somebody walks up to me, and they did on occasion, not many times, and they want to talk to me about God because there were evangelical Christians before I got saved. And they would say, can I talk to you about Jesus? I would respectfully listen to them. I didn't say, get out of here. You're hurting my feelings. Give me a safe space. I didn't do that. And I actually went to college in a time when the professor wasn't trying to brainwash us, but give us information to make up our own minds. And so we, were, we had the right to, to reject. We didn't get canceled. Oh, you, you believe this? Is, oh, no. No, you can't believe this. If you, if you, we won't buy your product or we won't say hi to you in the hallway. And, and I'll be honest with you, you know, I'm a, I'm, I'm a pastor. It is true. People like me and my friends, we're canceled. And I don't care. What do I care if the world cancels? I don't care. Jesus Christ accepted me. I don't care if the world, and that's just the way you're not supposed to worry. You're not supposed to. It's not that you want to be hated, you know. It's not that you go out of your way to be hated. It's that you accept that, 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 that people don't always like you, and that's okay. It doesn't matter. I'm not running for office. What was it that Jill Biden said? Jill Biden said something that made me laugh. What was it? She was speaking to Cisse, Cisse Pawadwe or something like that. Said, what? What are you saying? She said, Broadway? I said, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, Anyway, that, that made me laugh. I, I, I couldn't believe that. What are you trying to say? Stop it. Just stop it. We're not stupid. Come on. Anyway, um, that's the world that we live in. So, you can't go to church. You can't worship. You can't gather. Well, if you're at a tattoo parlor or a strip joint, you can. But you can't go to church because that's a super spreader. And people accepted that. I think it was wise for us to listen and to, and to do what we could do to make sure that I didn't lead you into a place that could hurt you. But after a while, we began to realize, you know what? I care about my sheep. If you want to come to church, I'm not going to keep you from coming here. If you want to get into the word, I'm here to teach you. If you want to have fellowship, it's up to you. I'm not forcing you. 
But people like me and others are, are being called, oh, you guys hate, you guys hate. Well, wait a minute, if it's a, if it's a protest or a riot, that's okay. But getting together in church to worship Jesus isn't, no, you're crazy, I don't listen to crazy people. I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. And he says, gather together. We do. We are careful. And I don't want to come off weird. And, I, and I'm moving in a direction I probably shouldn't go. I understand. But what we wanted to do was give you opportunity to make a choice. We have, we have places to, to be seated with your mask on. And I respect you. I respect you. Any concerns you may have, I respect you. I'm not here to dominate your faith. I'm to help your joy. And if I can make it a place for you to feel safe and be able to get into the word of God, that's why we're on, on air right now, online. No, you're not a lesser citizen in the kingdom. We respect and love you. But at the same time, let's get together and worship Jesus Christ. This is what, we, this is what we're called to do, right? But I've watched how easily people are led, just led. And I see people drive by with their windows rolled up in a mask. I want to grab the mask and let it go. <laughs> when I see him crossing the street to get away from me because I don't have a mask, I, I just trip on that. That's an old word. It means that it confuses and amazes me. <laughs> the seeds have been planted to accept a religious system. The church has already been put into a corner and the world is pressing. You may not see it, but it is. You're living in a different day. Freedom of speech is still a protected right that we have. And when people say, you can't say this, that's where the line is drawn. And I say, you don't tell me what I can say. Jesus Christ tells me what I can say. The line is drawn. No. And now that's, that's, not being, that's not being rebellious. No, that's just being aware of our rights that God gave to us. Paul made use of his rights when he made his appeal to Caesar. He says, to Caesar, I will stand. He appealed to his rights as a Roman citizen. And so I'm not saying that we should rebel. What I'm saying is the seeds are already planted. Pastors have already begun and have been for a while, but more so now. They've been aware that their churches are shrinking or disappearing entirely. They're afraid to say something that caused the people discomfort. But my dad was never afraid to tell me something that caused me discomfort. Why did he say it? Because he loved me. He wanted to protect me and keep me from making mistakes. As a pastor, that's what God has called me to do, to tell you the truth. And I do. Some appreciate it, some don't. Those who don't, there are plenty of places you can go where they'll tickle your ear until you're giggling out the door. There are other places, like this one, they'll say, no, this is what it says. Can we agree to obey Jesus Christ and be blessed by him? Because that's what he said. That's how it works. And in the last days, we're already seeing it. And what happens, and I'll close quickly here, verse 17, God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind, to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. So God is going to destroy this evil satanic empire, and then God is even using Satan as the instrument. And though they may unite thinking that they're going to rule, they're actually drawn together for their destruction. And God ultimately enthrones himself as God. And he is the world leader. And those who are pretenders will be destroyed. An antichrist false system, an antichrist evil rule will be destroyed. And until that moment comes, we must preach the truth of God. Do so with courage. Do so loving him. Do so with honesty, get into God's word, study his word, come to Bible studies, get involved so you can grow, be prepared, and learn how to communicate the truth of God. If you're able to be at a Wednesday night, come. If you can come to one of the women's things, do so. If you can be there at 6.30 for the men, do so. 
Because we're living in the last days, we want to be prepared. We want to be ready. Because one of these days, and it isn't that long from now, we will see Jesus Christ face to face. And I want to hear, well done, when I see him. Amen. And Father, we ask that you would work within us today, that you would have your way within us today. Our hearts are open to you, Lord, and our desire is to honor you. And so, Lord, have your way. And even as our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, there may be some right now in this room who need to get right with God, or perhaps in one of the overflows or watching online. Obviously, I can't see the overflow or those online, but I can see those who are here. And if you need to be right with the Lord, if your heart is strayed away or you've never even come to him before, this will be your opportunity. If you need prayer and you say, God, I want to be right with you, as our eyes are closed right now, would you raise your hand and let me pray for you right where you're at? Just raise your hand that I might see you. Father, you see these hands. You know the reason why they're being raised to you. I ask in Jesus' name that you would reach down and touch every person whose hand is raised. And Father, have your way in their life. We would yield ourselves to you. We will follow you. We'll be in your word. Lord, we'll learn to pray. And we'll fellowship with those who love you. And Lord, we'll tell others. We will learn and we will share. So work with us now. Wash us and cleanse us. Lord, fill us with your presence. And Lord, we will follow you. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving us of our sins. We bless you. You can put your hands down. And Jesus, please, work in us to your glory. In your name, amen.